one of the most frequent questions that Christians are asked is why did God allow such and such a tragedy to occur? If you haven't been asked that question yet, during the course of your life, if you talk to enough people, somebody will ask you that question. Why did God allow such and such a tragedy to happen? Usually people are asking that question when a large number of people die at one time. Or they ask that question when a calamity comes suddenly and unexpectedly. Interestingly, today, this morning, is the 20th anniversary of the Oklahoma City bombing, in which 168 people died and around 700 people were injured. And it's around two weeks, we're around two weeks removed from the two year anniversary of the Boston Marathon bombing. I remember that being in the news not too long ago. And now with our 24-7 news cycle and our smartphones, we have news coming our way all the time. And we have access to calamities and disasters not only within the United States. We have access to calamities and disasters and massacres throughout the entire globe. We are inundated to the point where we could almost become hardened to all the tragedies and all the calamities and all the disasters that occur. And when those things happen, either you will be asked or you may hear a Christian ask this question on TV, where was God when such and such a tragedy occurred? Now when that happens, there's usually two overreactions that sometimes come. One is that people can sometimes give a rash and hasty explanation for why such and such a tragedy happened. Charles Spurgeon preached a sermon entitled, Accidents, Not Punishments, in 1861, shortly after there were two train wrecks on 1825, 1861, and September 2nd, 1861. And in that message, now Spurgeon, by the way, believed in the sovereignty of God, but he was making a specific point in this message because he wanted to address the absurdity of some people who were saying, you know that August 25th train wreck that happened? It happened on a Sunday, and the reason why it happened is because those people were traveling on the Lord's Day, on the day of worship. So Spurgeon wanted to address that. And while he was somebody who extolled the sovereignty of God, he wanted to explain that is a rash and a hasty conclusion. You're going way too far to interpret providence. And you're putting intentions into people's minds for the mind of God when you have no right doing so. So that's one overreaction, a rash and hasty conclusion. But then there's the other side of the spectrum. And on the other side of the spectrum, there's those who make the mistake of saying, God has nothing to do with the tragedy that happened. As though God was on the outside looking in at His creation and His creatures. You might remember back in 2012, there were tornadoes that severely ravaged the Midwest. Places like Kansas and Illinois and Missouri suffered incredible, incredible devastation. And there was a Christian news program that was airing during that time, still airing to this day. And they have a segment during that program where people would email in questions. And one of the questions at that time came from a person who asked a simple and a short question that went like this. Why did God send the tornadoes? That was, the only, that was the question. The host who undertakes to answer those questions gave this response. He said, quote, God didn't send the tornadoes. God set up a world in which certain currents interfere with other currents. Cold air in the south mixing with warm air in the north spurs vortexes. So according to this host... God had nothing to do with the tornadoes. You're asking, why did God send the tornadoes? He had nothing to do with the tornadoes. Tornadoes just happen. Interestingly, he later went on to tell people, don't blame God if you build your houses in places where tornadoes happen. Not the best way to answer somebody's question. But is he right? God didn't send the tornadoes. That's not what God's Word says. God's Word makes it very clear 
Psalm 148, verse 8 says, The stormy winds fulfill His word. Psalm 107, verse 25 says, For He commands and raises the stormy wind, which lifts up the waves of the sea. I'm going to see another verse that points to that in a moment from the book of Job. But even in the book of Job, where God isn't the immediate cause of the winds that assail Job's house, you may remember that Satan couldn't even touch Job without permission from God. So whatever the secondary cause might be, the ultimate cause is the sovereign of the universe. And in some cases, maybe it's better to nuance that by saying the word allow than cause, but nonetheless, God is sovereign over all. So then, what then is happening in the midst of calamity? How should we react? What do we think about when we see calamities happen? I think we get a little bit of a framework for how to understand what God is doing in the midst of calamity by looking at some of the words of Elihu from Job 37. Now interestingly, in verse 11 of Job 37, Elihu said that God was the one who scattered the bright clouds. Then in verse 12, Elihu is the one who says, He turns them about by His guidance, so they go wherever He commands. But then in verse 13, He says this. He says, He causes it to come, whether for correction, or for His land, or for mercy. So while I want to say on the outset, we are incapable of tracing all the intentions of God's providence. There is a framework through which we could see some of which is most likely happening in the midst of tragedies. In Elihu's case right here, he's setting forth three things that are happening in the midst of, say, a storm. He says it's either coming, Job 37 verse 13, for correction. Now interestingly, that word that's used there in Job 37 verse 13 for correction, it's kind of signifying a rod. It more likely means, rather than correction, a chastisement or a punishment. So God sends it either for correction, or maybe better said, punishment, or He sends it for His land. Just a means by which God makes the land productive when rains fall and all of a sudden the land brings forth vegetation. God would even tell Job when He started to speak to him through the whirlwind in Job 38 verse 26, that He makes the rain to fall even on the lands where no man inhabits. Why? Because God is so gracious that He even provides for the living things that inhabit lands where no man inhabits. So He brings it either for correction, perhaps better said punishment, or He sends it for His land, or for mercy. Interestingly, there in Hebrew, the word that's used is lehased, for mercy. It's a word that we're used to associating with covenantal kindness. Doesn't necessarily always mean that. So it can mean God sends it for mercy. Kindness in general. Remember Jesus said, He makes His rain fall on both the just and the unjust. And that's a good thing if you live in an agrarian society. You say, thank you God for the rain. We're going to have a crop come, provided no locusts come, provided everything stays normal. Thank you God. He makes His rain to fall on the just and the unjust. It's what we call common grace. But it also could be an act of particular loving kindness. <coughs> particular covenantal love in which God sends His storm for a particular reason to bless His beloved, His elect his sons and his daughters. So, looking at that Elihu framework, right? We could say in the midst of tragedies, there are probably three things coalescing together. And we can't trace it out. There could be plenty more things happening. I'm just saying general framework, three things are coalescing together. So based upon that, I'm going to springboard from that, give you these three things. It's either going to be judgment, correction, or loving grace all mingled together in one. So for example, if a tragedy occurs and a person dies who has spurned the revelation of God in creation and has spurned the proclamation of the gospel, in that moment, that tragedy for that person when they die, it is a temporal judgment that gives way to them being in what the scripture calls Hades, where they will await the final sentencing to the lake of fire. In another case where somebody's a believer and a believer dies in a tragedy or a calamity, what are we to make of that? 
Romans 8.28 is still true. God causes all things to work together for good for those who love Him. So when a believer dies in the midst of a tragedy, it becomes the means by which God takes that believer from this earth into His presence. It becomes the means by which that believer leaves life on this earth and enters gain and glory with Christ. It becomes the means through which that person departs from this earth and goes to Christ, which is far better. It's love. It's grace. It's kindness. Or it could be for correction. God can use tragedies and calamities to providentially turn somebody around and lead them to the gospel. You might remember hearing some of our Reach Global team talk about a man who came to know Christ not too long ago. A man who was afflicted horribly by Hurricane Sandy, but now looks back at Hurricane Sandy and says something along the lines of, Sandy was the best thing that ever happened to me. If you hear my testimony, my testimony of coming to Christ, the providential impetus for that was 9-11. I came to know Christ shortly after. So disasters, tragedies, calamities, they often mingle together. Coalesce, judgment, loving grace, correction. So we shouldn't make hasty conclusions. And we shouldn't try to get God off the hook as though He needs to get off the hook. He's sovereign. He doesn't need to be let off the hook of anything. Everything He does is right. All His ways are just. Now with that framework, that's kind of a brief yet full counsel of Scripture answer as to how we should view and not view tragedies. But interestingly in our text this morning, Jesus is going to take a different approach. People approach Jesus and make reference to a tragedy that had recently happened. And you're going to see the way Jesus answers their bringing forth of that news. We begin this morning in Luke chapter 13, verse 1, where we read, There were present at that season some who told him about the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. So, While Jesus was in the middle of the long discourse that we had been studying in Luke chapter 12, the most recent portion of which dealt with the subject of judgment. Remember, Jesus was just talking about judgment. Make make yourself right with your adversary before you get to the judge. And we said it was kind of a paradigm for being right with the law of God through faith in Christ before the day comes wherein you stand before God. This is the context. And all of a sudden within that context, there were those who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled together with their sacrifices. Now we don't know in what tone they told him about this. We don't know their exact motives for telling Jesus this. But we do know that it was the most recent provocation done by Pontius Pilate. We haven't heard about Pontius Pilate in Luke's Gospel since the opening verse of Luke chapter 3. Remember he was in that who's who list of historical context in Luke chapter 3 verse 1. Pilate was no friend of the Jewish people. Some of you might remember from our Good Friday message how we unpacked that a little bit. I'll give a brief overview just so you understand who this guy Pilate was. According to the Jewish historian Josephus, Uh, When Pilate became governor, and by the way, he was the governor of Judea from A.D. 26 to A.D. 36. And when he became the governor, he was more like an antagonist to the Jewish people. Upon becoming governor, he moved his military headquarters from Caesarea to Jerusalem. And when he did that, he also brought in the Roman standards. He did this quietly and at night. And the Roman standards were basically pennants or flags or banners typically attached to poles. He brought them in quietly at night because he knew they wouldn't be well received by the Jews because on these banners were the image of the quote-unquote divine emperor. Well, word got around pretty quick and the Jews saw what he had done bringing these images into Jerusalem and they requested for him to remove those ensigns. So for five days they kept requesting it. Pilate wouldn't hear them. He wouldn't hear them. And then all of a sudden on the sixth day when they requested him to move them yet again, he threatened them with immediate execution. In which the Jewish people who assailed Pilate with those questions or accosted him with those questions said they would gladly lay down their necks for that cause. So Pilate reluctantly rescinded. But you get a little bit of who this man was. Josephus, right after that, goes on to tell another story of how Pilate took money from the temple treasury to build an aqueduct 
to bring in water to the city of Jerusalem. Now Pilate knew that the Jewish people weren't going to like this. And he was right. They gathered together and they formed a little kind of crowd to kind of beseech Pilate to give back the money, stop the construction. I'm not sure the exact details of that. But Pilate knew it was coming, so he had Roman soldiers dress like ordinary citizens and mingle in with the crowd. And whenever he saw the time to be right, he gave the order, and those soldiers showed that they were soldiers, and they began to mercilessly beat those who were in the crowd, causing that consternation. There's more infamous behavior of Pilate that could be recounted, but you can see that what the people are telling Jesus about right here, it's not exactly an aberration in Pilate's character. This was the kind of man he was. Now, what was the exact historical context for this? We don't know. Some have supposed that this was connected to Judas of Galilee, mentioned in Acts chapter 5, verse 37. He was a rebel who led other rebels. He was an insurrectionist who led other insurrectionists. And some people thought that some of his followers who scattered after he died were maybe found in the temple in Jerusalem offering sacrifices when all of a sudden Pilate wanted some retribution. We don't know what it was. It may have been that. But we do know this, these people were in Jerusalem and they were at the temple because that was the only authorized place in which you could offer sacrifices. And while they were there, think about this from a Jewish crowd perspective, they're worshiping God, they're in, so to speak, church. And all of a sudden, Pilate's soldiers come in and massacre them so that their blood mingles together with the blood of the sacrifices they were offering. So it's not that Pilate started to offer up mingled blood of their blood and the sacrifices. It's just the way it happened when they began to die and their blood was shed and it mingled with the sacrifices' blood. Now why were the people telling Jesus this? Perhaps they were trying to make sense of it. Perhaps they were trying to say, well, what do you think about that? What was that? What's your interpretation, Jesus, of that? You were just talking about judgment. What was that? Was that judgment? What are we supposed to make of that? So that could have been why they were asking it. Maybe, because there were a lot of people who were trying to trap Jesus. There could have been some negative intentions here to try to trap him. Because think about it. They were putting Jesus in a, a rock and a hard place, kind of, here. If he condemned the worshipers for some reason, I don't know what it would be. Let's say he did then all of a sudden the people would see him as a betrayer and kind of a Roman sympathizer. But if he condemned Pontius Pilate, Jesus was from Gal Galilee, just like that other rebel Judas of Galilee was. And Jesus' followers were from Galilee. Maybe he was an insurrectionist too that needed to be snuffed out. So maybe they were putting Jesus in between a rock and a hard place. But Jesus, in typical, awesome, Son of God fashion, cuts right past their question or right past their news report and he gets to their underlying assumption. They asked the question and behind their question they had an assumption as to why they thought this happened, this tragedy, this massacre. Look what Jesus said, verse 2. And Jesus answered and said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? Jesus saw right past their news report. He asked them a rhetorical question. We know it's a rhetorical question because he gives a quick answer to this question shortly. He asks them, do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than other Galileans because they suffered such things? And the answer is, yeah, they did. That's what they supposed. They did think they were worse sinners. That's why Jesus is asking the question. He's the Son of God. We see so many examples in the Scriptures when He knew people's thoughts. He knew what they were presupposing right here. And this wasn't a new way of thinking in the Jewish culture. This was something Jesus even confronted with His disciples. Remember John chapter 9, when His disciples see a man who was born blind. They ask Jesus this question. John chapter 9, verse 2, they say, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Remember Jesus' response? His interesting response, he says, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. So it wasn't that Jesus was saying, Behold a sinless man with sinless parents. No, he's saying this man's blindness is not connected to a particular sin of his, nor to a particular sin of his parents. In that man's case, it was so that the glory of God might be shown and the works of God might be shown because Jesus was about to heal that man and give him sight, the man who was born blind. But this wasn't uncommon, an uncommon way of thinking. Remember Job's 
discomfiters, as we might call them. Now, if you read through the story of Job, he's got those three friends who you really don't want as friends, nor do you want as enemies, because they just keep assaulting Job. And the first one who does, who we're going to talk about a little bit this morning, was Eliphaz. And Eliphaz accosts Job, and he tells, them, tells him, Remember now, who ever perished being innocent? Or were the upright ever cut off? Eliphaz goes on, he makes his intention clear towards Job. He says, Those who plow iniquity reap the same. So Job was suffering, and Eliphaz is saying, think about this, Job, remember, does anybody suffer for, not, for no reason? No, you must have done something. Those who reap iniquity or plow iniquity, they reap the same. Job, you have some hidden sin in your life that you need to deal with. So this was a common way of thinking. It wasn't surprising that the people thought that unusual tragedy, that unusual suffering, must be connected to some hidden sin or some degree of sinfulness. Jesus asks the rhetorical question, and he comes right back with a stern answer. He says, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. That was Jesus' response to the question. No, by the way, is in the emphatic position. When we say that, it just means it's the first word in the Greek sentence, and here you can feel the emphatic nature of it. No begins the sentence. doesn't come across that way in the English, but it's there in the Greek. No, Jesus tells them. So while they may have thought that violent way in which those people died at the hands of Roman soldiers was an indicator of their sinfulness being worse than other Galileans, Jesus said no. So the first lesson to learn right there is this, don't make the hasty assumption of thinking that human tragedy is some sort of index for the degree of human sinfulness. Human tragedy is not necessarily an index for the degree of human sinfulness. Sadly, I've heard some Christians make these kinds of assumptions about other Christians so now I'm going to make an application from this text. We just applied, we looked at the historical context, now a little bit of an application, because I've heard Christians kind of make that statement about other Christians, which categorically is incredibly different on so many levels. I've heard people say, so-and-so must have some sort of sin that God is dealing with them with, otherwise those things wouldn't be happening in their lives. At that point, when you say that kind of thing, you might as well get the necessary papers, go down to the local office or wherever you have to go to get your name officially changed to either Eliphaz or Bildad or Tophaz. Because that's what you're doing when you make that kind of broad brush statement. You have no right to make that sort of statement. When Eliphaz did that, God didn't like that at all. God spoke right to Eliphaz and by connection to Bildad and Zophar, I should have said. He said, My wrath is aroused against you and your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. So it wasn't only that they made this misassumption against Job, and they did. Look at Job chapter 2. When God is talking to Satan, he describes the punishment that he has given to Job, or the chastisements, the, the afflictions, perhaps better said, as being those that were without cause. As though to say God had some sort of mysterious providence involved, but it wasn't directly connected to Job's sin. So not only were these people maligning Job, in doing so they were maligning God. To say that God was doing this to Job. Because Job was some sort of hidden sinner. Interestingly, if you read Eliphaz's words in Job chapter 4, he seems to come to, this, come to this conclusion because he had a literally, literally, a hair-raising word come to him in the night. Literally, Job chapter 4 verse 15, his hair stood on end and he received a word in the middle of the night. And that word, presumably, he doesn't say that word came from God, but presumably that's what he was thinking because he goes on to tell Job, you're a sinner! You need to repent! In not so many words or in so many words. So let's be careful about revelations, about why Christians are suffering certain circumstances. Nephaz thought he had a revelation from God. Word came to him in the middle of the night. Hair stood on end. Thought, Job, this word's for you. And God later told him, my anger's aroused against you. Not only have you spoken negative things about Job that you shouldn't have, 
You put words in my mouth that you had no right putting in my mouth. So I think if there's a lesson that we could learn from this as Christians, is that we can say when we see Christians going through difficult providences, painful providences, let's not be those people who either say out loud or think in our heads immediately, they must have some sort of sin issue. Because there's no way that tragedy would have happened. There's no way that disease would have come. There's no way that thing would have happened if there wasn't some sort of sin in their life. If there is an issue that can be directly connected, and I'll speak about that later, that's a different story. But when there's no such thing, we shouldn't go assuming that there is. God's providence is mysterious, generally. And His painful providences in the lives of believers, I would say, are even doubly mysterious. But if the captain of our salvation was made perfect through the things in which He suffered, should we be surprised when we have to follow in His footsteps and we suffer painful providences? Jesus didn't lie to us. He told us, in this world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. Peter said, in regards to persecution, don't think it's strange when you're going through a fiery trial as though something strange happened to you. Suffering should be the norm. We should be having conversations with each other saying, is there something wrong? Why aren't we suffering more? Suffering should be the norm of living in a fallen world with sinful bodies and sinful things that we do. But more about that in a moment. Jesus didn't just want to protect His people from making wrong assumptions. He didn't just want to protect people in general from making wrong assumptions. Watch. He wanted them to make the proper application. So it wasn't just, don't make the wrong assumptions. He didn't just stop there. He wanted them to make the right application. And the right application was, but unless you repent, you all will likewise perish. So the lesson from the massacre, the people who brought the news reports, those who heard the news report after the people brought it, was not, why did those people die? What was God doing? Were they especially sinful? That was not the application. The application for all the people was this, repent. Otherwise, you too will likewise perish. You might put it this way. Temporal tragedies are providential caution lights. Whenever you see it, whenever it comes your way and you see it on the news or you get a a message on your phone, whatever it might be, temporal tragedies are meant to be providential caution lights. More about that soon. Because Jesus is going to reinforce that point. But watch, Jesus brings up another tragedy as though to tell the people, I'm aware with what's going on. I'm aware about what's going on. He says in verse 4, Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? Same kind of question. And the supposition in the people's minds was yes. We did. I mean, that's why that happened. Jesus mentions about a tower falling on people in Siloam. Now, we may be familiar with the pool of Siloam. Remember, that was where, in John chapter 9, Jesus sent the blind man to wash after he put the clay on his eyes. He said, go wash in the pool of Siloam. The man who was born blind did, and he was given his sight back. But we're not as familiar with the tower of Siloam. We don't have much information about this tower. Some have guessed that this was the aqueduct or connected to the aqueduct that Pilate had built. And if that was the case, you could see why the people would think that it fell upon those people there. People who assume this also assume that the people on which the tower fell were construction workers. Those are all assumptions that aren't based in Scripture. It's just somebody being creative. And yes, it is creative. And I guess it could have happened. But when you think of towers, you also think of like fortified structures for defense. So whatever structure it was, whether it was being constructed or whether it was there, it fell on 18 people in a seemingly random tragedy. And one of the ironies of that is that towers, which men built in those days for defense and protection, couldn't provide protection and defense when ultimately the time had come for those people to die. It's an interesting irony, yet a lesson to learn from that. So Jesus says, I know about this. I know about the tower. Now, before, before we get to another 
application that he's going to make. I want you to see something I think is rather interesting, which brings out another point. Jesus, when he says here, do you think that they were worse sinners than all other men? He uses a different word for sinners than he does in verse 2. In verse 2, he uses the Greek word harmatoloi, which is the common word for sinners, the most common one, referring to people who've missed the mark. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Here he uses the Greek word for debtors. Now I want to draw something out of that. Simply this. When the people were asking Jesus these questions or bringing to him this news report, Jesus didn't say, I know, bad things do happen to good people. He didn't go there. Because from God's perspective, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And in both cases, Jesus does not say the people were innocent like the worshipers in the temple, they may have been innocent as it relates to their interactions with Pilate. But they weren't innocent ultimately as it relates to God. No human being is innocent as it relates to God. And Jesus, in both cases, uses two different words for sinners. And I'm drawing out an opinion right here. And my opinion is, when you look, through, look between the lines, Jesus isn't denying the fact that they were sinners. He's not saying, well, they weren't sinners. He's actually using two different words to describe human beings as sinners. That's what we are. We are people who have missed the mark. We have sinned and fallen short of God's standard of holiness. And because we have, just one sin would be enough for God to take our life and cast us into the lake of fire. Just one sin, yet alone thousands upon thousands of sins. We are debtors. We're not only people who have missed the mark, but we are indebted to God with a debt that we can never repay to Him. We could spend forever in the lake of fire and never pay back what we owe to this holy and righteous God. So let's not miss what Jesus is not saying. He's not saying these people were just good people and you know what? Sometimes bad things happen to good people. No! We should all be so thankful that tragedies aren't happening left and right. We should all be happening that every time that we sin, we aren't dead in a moment. That our heart doesn't stop beating. That we are given another breath in our lungs. That's the proper standard. That's the proper view with which to view tragedies. It isn't to say, why did God allow that to happen to them? It's to say, oh my God, you are so gracious that you don't have those things happen left and right. Because if you weren't restraining the iniquity of men, our world would be in more chaos than we can even imagine. Revelation points to what that will look like more so. And if you were to give me what I deserve... I should have been dead and in hell a long time ago. So let's not make the mistake of sitting in the seat of judgment and saying, God, why are you allowing bad things to happen to innocent people? It's a wrong theological question to ask. We don't deserve to be here right now. We don't deserve our next breath. But God is so amazingly patient and gracious to us. So Jesus brings up this question to them. And he's going to answer it yet again. You think that they were worse sinners? You think they were the really bad people in Jerusalem? You think that tragedy was an index for the degree of their sinfulness? Jesus says in verse 5, I tell you no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. That's what Jesus is saying again in regards to the tragedy. Well, what's the first point we could take? I'm going to take a general point, and then we're going to just extract some more from the text. First point would be this. Going off of what we've already said, do not oversimplify. When tragedies happen, do not make broad brush statements like we referred to at the beginning. Oh, those people in the train wreck in 1861 on that Sunday, August 25th, they, they died because they were traveling on the Lord's Day. Don't oversimplify. Don't make wrong theological statements. God had nothing to do with that. As though He was on the outside looking in of history. Don't oversimplify. Now, let me say this by way of nuancing that statement a little bit. There are tragedies and there are problems and there are illnesses that can be connected to one's particular sins. There's a man who's given to quick-temperedness and he happens to be driving home one day, and he's given to quick-temperedness, and he loses his temper on the road with the wrong person, and the maniac takes out a gun and decides to enact retribution for his bruised ego. Providentially, that could be the case. That issue of a quick temper was never dealt with, 
And maybe that became the temporal means by which God took that person out of life on this earth. The person who is addicted to alcohol or addicted to chronic overeating or chronic smoking and lacks the self-control to steward their life in a proper, God-glorifying sort of way may come down with heart disease or cirrhosis, cirrhosis of the liver or lung cancer. It may. There may be a connection in that case between the actions and the illness that comes. A person who is driving home after a stay at a motel with their partner in adultery and all of a sudden loses control of their wheel and ends up dying in a car accident. It may be very clear that that was the moment in which God said, My patience, which is amazing and gracious, has run out this night. So there are cases where particular sins can be connected. But we shouldn't make broad brush statements when tragedies happen. So there can be cases. I'm not saying that. I mean, we even see the Bible has cases where citywide tragedies are connected with specific sins. We see that, right? In the case of Sodom and Gomorrah. You could look at the way Ezekiel says that they were gluttonous and they didn't give heed to the poor. Or you could look at their sins even within the book of Genesis and see how they were given to a rampant and sort of vicious kind of homosexuality trying to rape the guests of Lot. So there are cases where that can happen. But generally stated, we shouldn't oversimplify things. We should hear the message that Jesus is saying is to be heard loud and clear. The message that is to be heard loud and clear from tragedies is to be heard not by those who suffered in the tragedy, but by those of us who see the tragedy. And in a word, that message is repentance. That's the message Jesus had for those people. By extension, that's the message Jesus has for us. Repentance. What do you do when you view tragedy? What do you do? Even this morning, you're viewing it, right? You're viewing that there were people who were in the temple and all of a sudden they got massacred by Roman soldiers. You're viewing through the text of Scripture that there were people who were walking or standing by a tower when all of a sudden, seemingly out of nowhere, this tower falls on them. You've seen that now through the text of Scripture. What's your reaction to that? Jesus is telling you, by extension of Him speaking to the immediate hearers, Repent. Otherwise, you will likewise perish. And we'll get to the nuance of their perishing and our perishing in a moment. But let's talk about repentance. When Jesus says repent, the word there in the Greek is metanoiete. It's a combination, combination of two Greek words. A preposition, meta, which means change, and noeo, which means to think. So, fundamentally, the word repentance means a change of thinking. So Jesus is saying, change your thinking. Repent. But that change of thinking, we know, is connected with a change in behavior. Scripture makes that clear over and over again. Repentance isn't just crying, right? Repentance isn't just being having like remorse for sin. If, if that is there, great. And in many ways, that should be there. Godly sorrow does produce repentance not to be repented of. Amen. That should be there. But just because sorrow is there, just because tears are there, just because somebody says, I know I'm not where I ought to be, that doesn't mean repentance is there. I mean, I've heard people say that their whole lives. In some cases, their whole Christian lives. And there's no repentance. There's no change of thinking, really, because there's no change of behavior, ultimately. In Acts chapter 8, verse 22, Peter told Simon the sorcerer, to repent, but not just have a change of thinking. Repent of your wickedness. So have a change of thinking about your wickedness and leave your wickedness. In Acts 26, verse 20, Paul preached to those who were in Damascus and Judea and Jerusalem and to all the Gentiles, telling them, quote, they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with repentance. In other words, if you are truly repenting, there should be deeds that accompany that change of thinking. To say, I'm sorry, doesn't mean that repentance has happened. It's an about face. It's an actual move that has steps that accompany the move. And this wasn't a new idea. Remember, John the Baptist had said something similar in Luke chapter 3. Bear fruits in keeping with repentance. The idea is, have a change of mind, but then have fruits that show that you actually did have a change of mind that resulted in a change of behavior. 
Paul told the church at Corinth that he was afraid when he came back to them, that he would mourn over many who sinned earlier, this is the quote, and have not repented of the impurity, sexual immorality, and sensuality that they practiced. Repentance isn't just saying, I know this is wrong. Repentance is saying, you know what, I do know this is wrong. And I'm going to bear fruit in keeping with repentance. I'm leaving that which is wrong. I'm not going to fall into the trap of just saying, yeah, I just struggle with this thing my whole life. I'm going to say, no, no, I hear the message, Jesus. I'm going to repent. Think about this. Question for you to apply to your heart right now. When was the last time on a Sunday morning, Friday night, maybe two, whenever, but I'm going to say Sunday morning, that you heard a message and you were convicted in your heart and you said, I need to repent of that thing. What is it? Think about it. That's the message here. This isn't Pastor George just saying that. You see it right in the text. Jesus couldn't make it any more clear. Verse 3, verse 5, the message He wanted the people to learn. By extension, the message He wants us to hear in the midst of beholding this tragedy is repent, have a change of thinking, and have behavior that befits that change of thinking. So what is it that you need to repent from that you know is just so wrong? Has God been on the back burner for too long? What does it look like? Is it sexual immorality? Is it some sort of stealing? Is it some sort of bitterness? Is it some sort of backbiting? Is it just some sort of indifference towards God? What is it? Hear it. Hear the word of Christ this morning. Have a change of thinking. And don't settle with just living with that thing. Leave that thing. The call is urgent. Because the threat is real. Applying this to us, and then I'm going to get right back into the immediate historical context. When Jesus says that to us, repent and, or else you will likewise perish, we could apply that to ourselves by thinking about John chapter 3, verse 16, for instance. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, so that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So perhaps for some this morning, the application would be, you know, I've never repented of putting my trust in my own work doing, and I've never saw myself as a sinner that needed to be saved, and I've never seen the gospel logic that tells me somebody has to die for my sins, and if I deserve an infinite punishment, I need an infinite God to bear it, who at the same time was perfect man so he could stand in my place. So maybe the repentance that you have to bear this morning by the grace of God is that initial repentance that says, I leave my dead works behind. I leave my old life behind. I see Christ as Lord and Savior. I see Him as dying for my sins and resurrected from the dead. I repent. I have a change of thinking about Him. I have a change of thinking about me and my whole life. Jesus, You are Lord. I am going to follow You. And then if you're a Christian, maybe you apply it something like this. Jesus, I'm so sorry for playing games with your word. I'm so sorry that your word tells me I shouldn't be living in this whatever sin it is. And I've allowed it to stay for too long. And I love you, and at the same time, I have a holy, reverent fear of you. And I don't want to be chastised. I don't want to prove myself to not be a true follower of you. I hear your word this morning. I repent. Not just a change of thinking, but a change of thinking that manifests itself in behavior. Oh, how God will be so glorified if that happened in abundance this morning. It would be His work bringing it about, yes. But oh, how He would get such glory. All right. The immediate context of this. I want to say this, and then we'll conclude with one closing thought. Jesus told the people there, Repent, or you will likewise perish. The word that's used here in the Greek for likewise, combination of two Greek words, seems like that happens a lot, right? <laughs> he says, hos, which means as, altos, which means same. So basically Jesus is saying, you saw these two tragedies happen? Tragedies just overtook these people. If you don't repent, context of the Bible, immediate hearers, if you guys don't repent, you all are going to likewise perish. 
That had immediate application for Jesus' hearers because don't forget what happened in 70 A.D. In 70 A.D., when the siege of Jerusalem was completed, led by the Roman Titus, they went into Jerusalem, they ransacked Jerusalem, the temple was turned over and destroyed so that not even one stone was up upon one another. Even Josephus tells us that some of the structures in Jerusalem fell upon the people. We know the Romans massacred thousands upon thousands of Jews. So immediately, and we'll talk about this Lord willing next week because Jesus is going to give a little bit of a parable that expounds upon this more. Immediately for his hearers, which would be the Israelites, remember he came to his own, but his own did not receive him. He was saying, you repent. You think that was a tragedy, what you saw? You have no idea what's coming, Jerusalem. This is your day, but you don't see it. The Messiah is here. Repent. And they didn't repent. And a disaster that was unlike any other the nation had seen. Yeah, it may have been like Babylon, but this was much, much worse. Came in 70 AD, when people were massacred by the Romans in a way much worse than Pilate had done in the temple, and when structures fell upon people in ways, presumably, that was even much worse than the towers that fell upon those in Siloam. So what do we learn from that? The call is urgent because the threat is real. You don't know how many days you have. You don't know if you have a tomorrow. Tomorrow is promised to no one. You don't know what happens today. I'm not trying to intentionally scare you. But if I were intentionally trying to scare you, that would be okay because the threat is real. If you leave this place and you're not right with God, you're not truly trusting in Christ, you don't have fruits that evidence the fact that you actually love Him and you walk with Him and you serve Him, please know the call is urgent because the threat is real. You may not face the same exact threat as those in Jerusalem at that time. No, you don't. But we face something, and you might even say much worse than the destruction of Jerusalem. We face a lost eternity in hell. So you might say then, okay, the title of this message was Good News in the Midst of Tragedy. Where's the good news in the midst of tragedy? It's been right in front of you. Surprisingly, it's the call to repent. You might be like, where's he going with this? In Luke chapter 3, when John the Baptist came on the scene preaching in the region of the Jordan, he began to preach a baptism of repentance. And when he was preaching a baptism of repentance, he called the people to bear fruits in keeping with repentance. And the people were so poked in their heart that they said, What shall we do? What shall we do? What shall we do? And John the Baptist gave them some specific instructions of what to do. He told them, You have two tunics, get rid of one and give it to, give it to somebody else. Be content with your wages, Roman soldiers, and start trying, stop trying to extort people gave them specific things to do. But listen to what Luke chapter 3, verse 18 says. So, with many other exhortations, he preached good news to the people. Euon Galizo. It's where we get the word gospel. The euangelion, the gospel. With many other exhortations, he preached good news to the people. To which you're thinking, what? Repentance? That's good news. I got this caricature in my mind of like people just saying, repent, repent, repent. And the Bible would tell you the repentance call is good news. Why? To use language from Acts chapter 11, verse 18. If you are granted grace to repent, then you've been given repentance unto life. Repentance and saving faith are two sides of the same coin. If you truly believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, that saving faith evidences itself in repentance. There are two sides of the same coin. So the call of repentance is good news. You're here. You've beheld the tragedy, but you're still alive. You get to behold the good news call of repentance. And why is it good news? Because the Scripture says that repentance, that is true repentance, Acts 11.18, is repentance unto life. You escape, if you will, the ultimate calamity. And you are given the ultimate blessedness. You escape the ultimate calamity of an eternal judgment. And you are given the ultimate blessedness of eternity, enjoying the immeasurable, glorious presence of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The call to repentance has been sadly painted as a caricature 
as a call that's not a good call. But when he did, it fits the Luke 3.18 description as being euangelizo. It's good news. The place of repentance is where the Christian life begins. You can't become a Christian without having saving faith that evidences itself with repentance. The Christian life begins with repentance. And the track on which the Christian life runs is a track of faith and repentance. You don't just repent one day and no other days. The Christian life is a life that runs on the track of continuous faith and perpetual repentance. Good news all the way through for those who heed Jesus' call. Amen. Let's pray. Oh, Father, thank you. Thank you for the words of your Son. Thank you that they are indeed spirit and they are indeed life. Thank you for the way in which He knows what we need to hear and He always knew what people needed to hear. So Father, this morning, while there's so many things that we could thank you for, the way the full counsel of your word will protect us from wrong assumptions or keep us from wrong theology, we can thank you for so many things. But we thank you for being here this morning, for yet another morning where we can hear that glorious call to repentance. And we could turn from ourselves and our self-righteousness afresh, as it were, and look to Jesus, the author, author and finisher of our faith. Jesus, thank you. Because apart from you dying in our place and bearing the wrath that we deserve, no repentance could ever do anything for us. No turning could turn us anywhere good. But because you came and you lived the perfect life and you died in our place, we could actually turn unto life by your grace. So this morning, we want to rejoice in that. Jesus, we acknowledge you as the only way, the only truth, and the only life. When somebody turns, we acknowledge that you are the only door that they could walk through. And your way, the narrow way, way, is the only road that we could stay on. So by your grace, may you keep us focused on you, continuously trusting and perpetually repenting. Whatever it is that you want to deal with us about this morning as individuals, Father, may it be, and may you find us not only swift to hear, but quick to repent. And Father, for those who perhaps have not put saving faith in your Son, may this be the morning perhaps when you grant them repentance unto life and they say, I see the tragedy, I heed the urgent call, and I trust the Savior as my Lord and Savior. So Father, we love you. Thank you for the privilege of being here this morning. We pray that your word would bear fruit. And we pray even as we sing about our Christ right now, that you would cause us to sing with hearts full of thanksgiving. Humble, grateful, thanksgiving. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.